and then right then uh, there was another leak, uh, a memo from uh, the CEO. That was leaked, and it uh, one of the one of the phrases in that was, "We're we're not watching what players say. Let's watch what players do." And so players decided they would do something. What is Elon Musk? What is Elon Musk? Spaceship. Spaceship violence, essentially. What is Elon Line? Elon Line, I think, started as a, as a computer game, and, and he has become obviously quite a bit more. But. 300,000 people in a box with almost no rules, and let's see what happens. Internet spaceship, a community. I'm having a funny community. <laughs> Oh, do you want me looking at you or okay, yeah. Uh, should I look at either camera or look at you? Look at you the whole time, yeah. What is Elon? Oh wow. Oh, that's an evil, horrible question. What is Eve Online? Um, Eve Online is a is a, a particular window onto a, a, a virtual world um, which is populated by the good, the bad, um, kind of every part of human society you could possibly imagine, but in this fantastic, really, really very, very cool science fiction kind of universe where you get to be a starship captain and, and, and literally do whatever it is you want to be, do whatever you want to do, um, uh, and, and, and live an alternate life, which is so much more meaningful than some of the, the tedious things you do in this life. EVE Online's game world is New Eden, a far-flung cluster of about 8,000 star systems linked together by an intricate network of stargates and wormholes. The highly populated central star systems, known collectively as HiSec, are home to well-policed trade centers. These are the safer areas, but even in the most secure systems, the automated Concord police response is punitive, not preventative. Heading out into peripheral low-sec space, sees this relative safety give way to perilous outlaw country, with far fewer rules. Beyond that lies the ever-shifting feudal territories of the Nullsec regions. This is the single shard sandbox universe, in which EVE's players are free to roam, exploit and fight. It is here that the player population of hundreds of thousands of starship pilots interact, often violently, as they compete for resources, territory and profit, in pursuit of their endless quest to fuel egos, empires, and good fights. It is this interaction which gives rise to Eve's unscripted, unpredictable, emergent gameplay. After about a couple of hours of trying to get accustomed to what was going on and what Eve was, it sort of slowly dawned on me that this is by far the most interesting thing that's happening in video games right now, and probably the most interesting thing that's ever happened in video games. And the thing is, you only realise that after spending a lot of time trying to understand exactly what's happening here. As soon as you could, there's, there's a click moment, and after that, you, you get it. Like, you get why this is so interesting. And I think I'll, I, don't, I don't see a point at which I'll stop being interested in EVE at this point. I'm not a player, I'm an observer. I don't play EVE, but I find the culture entirely fascinating. And I think that it's the most interesting thing to observe in, in the whole of games right now. 
Eve is is a game unlike anything else. It, it is a game that at a, li a high level we think of as, as real, and there are many reasons why. Eve is a PC game, it's a computer game that you play with your mouse and keyboard. You pay $15 a month or so in a subscription fee to, to keep playing the game, and you fly around in space, you mine asteroids, you build structures, you ally with and, you, uh, and against other players. I like to tell people that Eve isn't so much a game as a story about what people do when left alone with each other. You're in this big massive universe with practically no rules and most of what makes Eve Eve is what the players get up to. So it's, it's kind of the world's biggest social network. It's a giant chat room with spaceships. Eve Online is a place where good people can do bad things. But it, it's also a tool for the creation of dysfunctional families. Unlike any other game out there, it is a single shard sandbox. And there are two big parts to that. One being a single shard, meaning that unlike other games that have millions or hundreds of thousands of players, in EVE, our hundreds of thousands of players are literally all playing together all the time. Every action that they do, they are doing in a world with everyone else. EVE Online is a very sort of, I would describe it as like a social microcosm of a civilization. Uh, most games out there divide up humans in very small groups. So you get play a game like World of Warcraft and they have many servers. So you might have, what, 10, 11 million people play World of Warcraft, but uh, on any given server that you're playing, when you're playing World of Warcraft, you're only playing with uh, about 2,000 people, I think, on a server. A sandbox is a place where with every action you take, you make a change. You step into the sandbox and you leave footprints. You can take tools in the sandbox and dig holes, and sometimes other people fall in those holes. You can build sandcastles, or you can go knock over somebody else's sandcastle. And so for us, right, the idea that we have hundreds of thousands of people playing this game in one sandbox, it makes it unique in all respects. It means that everything a player does has a permanency, has an impact, it matters more than anything anybody does in any other kind of game. And that is what leads to these giant stories, these things that you hear about EVE Online players, that the, the assassinations and the heists and the, the corporations that go to war with tens of thousands of players on a side at a time, these things don't happen in any other game. And we really think that is more about the single shard sandbox nature of things than it is at all about the fact that you're flying around in space on a computer. I just think that EVE is such a unique thing, it's such a different thing to anything else that exists because if you take, you know, World, World of Warcraft's a great example, so um, there's, there's guys who play World of Warcraft and they play in a group of 40 players and they train for months to fight this cool dragon and eventually they'll kill it and a couple of months later perhaps another group of guys will do the same thing and they'll beat that content. But the things that are happening in EVE now have historical context from things that happened five years ago and none of this was developed, none of this was generated by CCP. The thing that makes EVE special is that every major event that's happened within EVE in the last 10 years has been done by the players. It's all narrative, all the narrative is player generated. And so the stories that exist within EVE Online are, are organic. They, they, they spawn from a group of people who are very passionate about the game and, and love it very much. And, and in 10 years time, when we're getting towards the end of the second decade of EVE, we'll be talking about things that happened 15 years ago. And, 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 and CCP look after the game, but the players are what make it. And that's what makes EVE so special. Is what, interests, that is what interests me about the game, is, what you, is the idea that the game itself is actually not a very interesting part of the process. And the interesting part of the process is the organisation, management, the madness, that you look at in retrospect and say to yourself, I had a good experience because I was there when this happened. Although yeah. you might not have known about it when it was happening, because you're sh running at, what do you say, 10% of normal game speed. So you're not even sure if you're alive yeah. or dead. It's the meta game yeah. that is what keeps people going. Mm. And the, I'm going to have to say it on it, but being able to say that I was there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, but this is like Waterloo, right? The British Army wanted to know exactly what had happened at Waterloo, so they sent a, they sent a um, questionnaire round to all of the officers, and they got conflicting answers back from almost all of them. Nobody knew exactly what was going on. 
it's that whole von Clausewitz thing, isn't it? You know, the moment the plan dissolves, the moment you actually engage the enemy. And that's exactly what seems to happen here every single time. A lot of Eve, well, a very, a very big part of Eve is what a lot of us refer to as Eve offline, which is the the scheming and the plotting and the deal making and such over Skype or over you know Mumble or Ventrilo or whatever chat channel or chat medium that you use, and that appeals to people that want something more than just acquiring you know the next big thing or the next set of armor or whatever else like that because Eve is. While it's all, it, while it is about like money and assets and stuff, it's mostly about power, and people who have larger aspirations than just as, you know escapism, getting away from the real world for a couple of hours and killing a monster. I think that because Eve is all about human interaction on one level or another, there's no real fantastical elements to it. It's really all about pitting yourself against other people. I think that that is what appeals to a certain type of individual, no matter what their age is. Um, I almost never actually log into the game. I, I don't really find the game itself that intriguing because I've played it for too long. Um, I just talk to people. Uh, I run an alliance, and you don't even have to be in the game to do that. You just need to have uh, chat clients. So, how do you describe a game where some of the players don't even play the game? You know, that's uh, sort of the, something that I think gives marketers nightmares. Eve is all about uh, permanence and risk. And there is no other MMO that can even begin to compare to the sense of loss that happens whenever you lose something that you've worked, you know, weeks or months or even years to achieve. You can you can literally make someone cry real tears whenever they their their alliance is destroyed, whether through military means or subterfuge or what have you. And there's nothing else out there that, it can, that can mimic that, not to the scale that Eve does. At the center of Eve's bustling commercial universe is Gita 4-4. The Kaldari Navy assembly plant began life as one of thousands of orbital stations scattered throughout New Eden. But as Eve's complex, player-driven market matured, the conditions were perfect for its rise to the status of marketing superhub, attracting thousands of players every day. New Eden's endless cycle of creation and destruction is fueled by trade. Every populous region has its own hub, each with its own opportunities and scams. But Jita is by far the largest and most notorious. Like Wall Street, when Jita sneezes, all of New Eden catches a cold. And when Jita burns, Everyone feels the heat. So uh, ultimately, it's a game. You know, it's, it's a game, but it's a little bit more than that. Um, you know, if you're if you play it, and you can kind of play it casually, I guess. But for the people who are at Fan Fest, they're usually not casual players. Um, you know, it's a, something that can take over basically as much of your life as you are willing to let it. I I, th I think that there's something to be said about the sheer amount of people's time that they invest in EVE. Like my instinct when I came here last year was, why are people doing this instead of real life? And that, that was a, there's a kernel of darkness in that question, I think. Like why are people forfeiting real experiences essentially for something that's virtual? And what I've come to understand is that it's not a matter of real life or EVE, that they're literally the same thing. Like EVE is a part of people's real lives. And when I talked to somebody about that last year, I was out having a cigarette with a guy out there um, just in front of the harbour, and I was like, you know, steeled myself. I was like, don't, don't you think you might be missing out a little bit on real life by investing so much of yourself in here? And he just kind of went, I have a spaceship in real life, which I think is at the heart of it. Really. Like, real life is boring, and Eve isn't. And that's why I think people find it so seductive and absorbing. For some people, Eve isn't boring. For, for others, it's a hobby. Uh, for some of us, it's kind of part of our lifestyle now. Uh, the whole marketing line for Eve is Eve is real. And honestly, it can be as real as you want it to be. The company behind EVE Online is CCP Games, an Icelandic development studio founded in 1997 with the goal of delivering a unique, socially focused online game experience. Drawing inspiration from galaxy-exploring science fiction classic Elite, tactical card games like Magic the Gathering, and pioneering massively multiplayer sandbox Ultima Online, in 2003, the small Reykjavik-based team delivered EVE the second genesis. From then on, the universe of New Eden flourished. 
As EVE Online enjoyed year-on-year -year subscriber growth, CCP grew from a small team to a corporation of hundreds of employees with the capability to nurture its creation and to expand upon the original vision. We look at ourselves and we will always have as the janitors of EVE Online, which implies that we're just cleaning up the mess, we're changing all the light bulbs, we're <laughs> fixing the broken windows, we're maybe installing a new floor because we want new tenants on the on the balcony. What is CCP's role? They break the monotony. We destroy things and then form stability, and that happens over and over and over again. And then CCP comes in and it's like, tweak, go at it. They're kind of like the kid, <laughs> a, a, a little kid with an ant farm. You know, they get their little farm and they have their ants and the ants dig their tunnels and everything is great, but the kid can still come along and grab the ant and shake it. <laughs> and then all the tunnels get completely destroyed and all the ants are like buried alive and panicking and just trying to survive. And I think every once in a while, CCP, for the most part, they sit there and they watch and they, they, they research and they pay attention and they, they enjoy watching, but every once in a while, they're like, you know what, let's shake the ant farm. Let's see what happens. It's a very interesting company, and it's one of the reasons why it's worth it as press to come out to FanFest. Because so much of how they do things, I think, is tied into the Icelandic culture. Um, even the, the space, the Harpa Center, feels like it kind of fits into the, the world of EVE Online. So it's really neat to kind of see them in Iceland and see the office. These people, I always joke that they work like accountants and they drink like Vikings. I think this, the thing that sets CCP apart from every other game company is, first of all, its location. Uh, being in Iceland here, I've had the opportunity to, to you know, tour the facility with Hilmar, and it's an amazing place. And because it's so isolated here, they've, they've built a very, uh, a, a very strongly bonded company. They're in sort of their own little world here, and I think that really helps them be creative in, in cool ways. All of us are CCP. <laughs> no, I mean, sitting here at FanFest, it's kind of hard to, to describe who and what CCP is other than saying it's a collection of the people that work at CCP and the people that contribute to CCP. And I think the people that contribute to CCP are all of the players that we have playing both EVE and Dust at this moment. One, two, three, go! <laughs> but yeah, if you want to look at as a whole, this. Yes, it all, is the community. We are E. Because you take the community away, you just have a game. But with us, it's, it, it exists. How would you define the Eva Mind community? Ruthless and cunning uh, and creative beyond compare. I mean, I think that's really the, the thing that, that appeals to me personally is, is the sheer amount of creativity that the players put into this. They, they take full advantage of the fact that we have these tools and we have these options, we have this freedom, and they do amazing things that just go far, far beyond what the producers uh, ever imagined. I'd say that they're dedicated. I think they're probably more passionate about Eve than we are, if that's even possible. Um, I think they're clever. I think they're clever and they enjoy some degree of chaos, which I think is healthy. I think Eve actually has the nicest community of any MMO, but it just has such a bad name from people think all these oh, um, scams and heists and shit are going on every day. It's, it's not. We are the most protective bunch of dicks you'll ever meet. Um, we treat each other like absolute crap, but if anyone else outside of our community tries to attack any of us, we will all rise up like a family and defend ourselves. Uh, we're a very vocal, very strong, very united, passionate community, and I've never seen anything like that. That is an excellent time to meet everyone you're playing with and to meet new people. Just get together to sort of like celebrate what, what, what we have and what we've created. Because I mean, for me, 
uh, the community is the, the bigger core of, of everything. So th this is like a celebration to what actually the community achieves. For CCP, it means uh, getting to meet our players, talking about spaceships for three days, usually longer, seeing old friends. Uh, like we, there are people that play our game that we're super good friends with in real life, getting to see them and come out and hang out with them. It also, I think, means frantically trying to get features ready to show at FanFest. Like, <laughs> and then after FanFest, like, oh no, we lost basically a week of work. Guys, we really got to crunch now to get back up. I think that like, uh, it means ultimately a lot of work, but a lot of payoff and a lot of fun. It, it's, it's really unique. For a game that's known as terrible people doing terrible things, everyone is very happy to be here, everyone's very friendly. It's a very hard game to get into in terms of complexity, but you talk to anyone and they're willing to walk you through it, to explain how things work, to talk about their ships and their stories. So the game itself is incredibly competitive and almost nasty in a number of ways, but the actual people who play it are incredibly warm and friendly, which I find really, really fascinating. Hi, hi. We're here filming for a documentary called The Tale of Internet Spaceships. Oh. Um, I suppose you all play Eve? Yes. yes. Um, He's the dude to talk to. Okay, well, great. Do you mind? <laughs> it's a lot more fun to sit here with the table of all my friends and shout out each other um, it's... in person and here with a bunch of other people. Of course, FanFest in general is pretty awesome just because you can come here and just talk about the stuff that you really like and people here actually care and know what you're talking about. So, yeah. So what's your expectation for FanFest? Uh, lots of good times. Good times and beer. Lots of beer. <laughs> yeah, I think the beer is a given. My expectations for FanFest is a hell of a lot of fun because I've been here one night and I've met so many people and everybody's really nice. It's just fantastic. A giant mistake. We built something great. We weren't going to let them destroy it. Well, Encarna was their, um, to be quite blunt, their really pathetic attempt to uh, follow through on that five-year-old promise of us being able to walk around with bodies and stations and interact with each other and have little mini-games and open up a store if we wanted to and, and go that whole aspect. Uh, that was their original attempt to make Eve more personable, to get us out of the ship so that we weren't just this disembodied figure, but we would actually have face-to-face -face meaning in the hopes of creating even greater social interactions and greater emotional attachments. Uh, it was very flawed technical implementation, you know, it, it was half-assed, there wasn't a lot you could do, there still isn't a lot you can do, so Encarna was basically a failed technology attempt. I was there. I'm telling you. I was there. Well, Incarna was uh, a vision of expanding EVE from outside of just spaceships. Um, because in EVE, you're basically, you are the pilot of a spaceship, but you are the spaceship. Um, 
And the idea that they wanted to do was to um, expand that so that you could get out of the ship and, you know, run around space stations and, you know, derelict areas and, 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 and have a sort of avatar-based gameplay the same way that uh, other MMOs have, like, you know, World of Warcraft. Um, and some of the technology they built to do that, uh, the character modeling technology, the clothing technology, all that sort of stuff is really impressive stuff. Um, but the problem is that the people who are currently paying their game and paying the bills, um, they didn't sign up to play an avatar-based game. They signed up to blow up spaceships. Uh, unfortunately, CCP got distracted by, I, I wouldn't even care to guess what. I was working at the company when I saw the direction they were headed. I didn't agree with it then, because whenever you divert so many resources away from what the vast majority of your paying customers consider to be the gameplay that they love, towards something that they did not ask for, then it should have been obvious where this was all going to lead. The fact that especially they, their, their reach exceeded their grasp, but they couldn't quite get something that was a game, that you know, all you could do was walk around this, this empty room by yourself in, a, in an incredibly social game like that. I mean, someone should have stopped them and said, that's not right, you can't do that. That just, you just shouldn't, it shouldn't even be considered that we could release something that was a single player room in a multiplayer game. I mean, that's, that's crazy. When Incarna, the first release of Incarna came out, and it was relatively limited, you basically could get out of your ship and you were in a hotel room. Um, but that's pretty much all you could do. Um, people got really upset, first because it didn't really add a significant amount of new gameplay, uh, but second because CCP decided to force players to use it. Um, and they absolutely hated that. Um, both for the fact that it just made things a little bit more awkward, but also because nobody likes to be pushed around. Nobody likes to be told, oh, this way you like to be doing things. You can't do that anymore. You've got to do it this way. So, like, basically at that point, people lost their shit. Um, they had had a bunch of successes fairly early on in the Eve's you know, career. Many of the early expansions were really well received. Um, they had actually had a couple of failures before then, and I don't think they really learned the right lessons from them. They, they said, oh, these are too small. We need to reach bigger. We need to do something bigger and better and, and more awesome. Um, and they also saw that these, all these games were making tons of money with microtransactions. They said, ah, I, we have some fanatical players that fly all the way to Reykjavik to you know, come and hang out with us. I bet they'll pay us a lot of money for a monocle or for a pair of pants or for some shoes. And, and those two combined were just kind of a poisonous combination. What was the monocle? What was what? That was the next oh, store. So, <laughs> luxury items. <laughs> luxury items. Monocle Gate was uh, a hilarious example of, uh, of again, Kool-Aid drinking from CCP. Um, at the same time they released Incarna, they tried to get in on the free-to-play monetization boom, which had been taking place in the games industry. And the idea was that when you had these avatars, which, mind you, you couldn't interact with other people as an avatar, because when the game was added, you just had this one room. <laughs> but you were supposed to want to spend real money uh, in a subscription game to buy cosmetic items for your character, i.e. Uh, fancy trench coat, clothes, boots, uh, monocles. So when Incarna was released in its hilariously buggy and foolish form, uh, they also released this store uh, where they would sell these items called the, uh, the Nex Noble Exchange or something or other, and introduced this currency. And uh, they priced it in a very foolish way. Monocle Gate is a, a kind of a poor name because it, what, the problem wasn't that the monocle was $70 or whatever. The problem was that a pair of shoes were $10, and that was the cheapest thing you could get. Um, so, so really, if, if, you, if there was a $70 monocle, I don't care. They could sell all the $70 monocles they want, but, but they were advertising you could dress up your character, but you spent more on virtual clothes than you did on actual clothes, and that's not okay. So 70 bucks for a monocle. 
And uh, the t-shirts you could buy in the EVE Online store cost less than the t-shirts you could buy that didn't actually exist. This guy made a very, very simple pic uh, picture that had, on one side of it, it had, okay, here's the t-shirt in game for equivalent of $20, and here's a t-shirt in the real world on the EVE website for $17.99. What the hell? So uh, Monocle Gate was when the pricing was announced with Incarna, so there's a lot of rage about the lack of features, there's a lot of rage about the fact that Incarna itself was not implemented well, and then the pricing was just an insult to injury. And that, uh, that resulted in an awful lot of anger from the player base who wanted more spaceships. The fact that they were so incredibly expensive and so incredibly out of reach, you know, for something that players were so excited about was a big part of why there was a, a very angry, uh, visceral response to the fact that, uh, that CCP thought we were way more invested in what we were willing to spend than we actually were. It felt like it, felt like it was an attempt at CCP to, to grab money. And it, it felt like a move that a lot of other companies would make that we expected CCP not to make. And I think that's part of a lot of why players got so angry about it was because we've always believed in CCP as a company that's stuck to its creative vision, that's, that's stuck strictly to a subscription model, um, to not turn this into a, a real-life capitalist adventure. They want us to, to uh, in, engage in freeform capitalism inside the universe, but players really don't want that capitalist, you know, money-grubbing feel with how we interact with CCP as a company and, and how we spend our real, our real dollars. And then when CCP was given another chance to say, wait, 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 no, guys, we were just putting it out there to see what you would do, test the waters with this, they got really defensive and they put out this really defensive dev blog that had this uh, one phrase, well people pay a thousand dollars for Japanese uh, high fashion uh, jeans and it and people just got annoyed by that because I mean we're, we're playing internet spaceships so around this time, again, you have lots of factors going into this. Uh, a uh, CCP internal magazine uh, called Fearless went out. And uh, in this magazine, uh, the cover of it was a picture of uh, Gordon Gecko from the movie Wall Street and with a tagline of greed is good. Now, of course, it was greed, and, greed is good with a question mark by it. And inside the article, they tried, inside the, the magazine, they tried to um, have pros and cons on monetization, essentially discussing what they were going to be added, adding into the game. So this was leaked, and uh, it was leaked around the time of uh, the $1,000 designer jeans article and the $70 monocles. And then right then, uh, there was another leak, uh, a memo from uh, the CEO to all staff, basically telling people that the, 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 the rage from players was just noise on a forum that they should ignore. That was leaked, and it, uh, one, of the, one of the phrases in that was, we're, we're not watching what players say, let's watch what players do. And so players decided they would do something. Yeah, that was what really put things over the edge, because they're saying, okay, well, they're not going to listen to what we say, so we will torch the place. <laughs> It was literally a call to arms. When players saw that, okay, so you're not going to listen to us, so if the only thing that you'll pay attention to is what we do, okay, fine, I'm going to cancel my sub subscription, I'm going to shoot this virtual monument inside the game until I run out of ammo. What was your first thought when you saw the Gita Rice button? Honestly, and this is interesting, like truly honestly, I was standing right here where I'm sitting right now, uh, and I got a phone call, phone call and some emails about, you know, hey, uh, we just launched, I know, uh, I know you're out at dinner with some business partners, but there's a thing happening in EVE that I think you should know about. Uh, the people are rioting, and I was like, what? The people are rioting? <laughs> what am I, like a French monarch? <laughs> Players decided, okay, well, we're gonna riot. By the thousands, they went into Jita and destroyed, Shot a monument. They destroyed a monument. <laughs> well, CCP had made this monument that uh, 
was indestructible. And it was a monument to something that happened way early in the game. And uh, so people just all gathered around and shot multicolored lasers at it. Kind of like, hello, we're your customers over here. Come talk to us. You know, it was very pretty to see you know, like hundreds of starships throwing missiles and lasers at this, this poor hunk of stone in space. Um, and they just kept on doing it uh, to, to demonstrate, you know, how opposed they were to this. So the Geo riots were a direct response to Incarna and to the Monaco Gate. And it was a, it was a, a, a form of, a simplest way to put it is it was, a, it was a protest movement. It was much like Occupy Wall Street or, or uh, you know, the riot in Tiananmen Square or, or any number of things of, of players wanted to, to have a very, very physical, visible, uh, undeniable, unshakable response that CCP couldn't ignore. And Jita's well known for the fact that, that there's a lot of traffic to that system anyways. It's the largest trade hub in the game. And so uh, it's, it's critical to Eve's economy. Uh, but what it also means is that there's already an enormous server load on that system. And so anytime players can go and fill that system with more people, more, more spaceships, more, and, and really put pressure on that server load, they can, they can physically impact the game's performance. And, and so in their attempt to do so, they did. They, they, they slowed things to a halt. They made it incredibly hard to trade in that system. And it was, it was, a, it was something that CCP had no choice to, but to respond to, not just because of what they were doing, uh, the failures of understanding the community and understanding what we, like I said, what we appreciated about the, the company, but also uh, they had to respond because physically their servers, you know, the technology that supported that was, was struggling and they, they had no choice. Honestly, it wasn't as exciting as <laughs> people made it out to be uh, on the media side of things. Uh, because again, all we were doing was just getting in ships, orbiting this structure and just shooting at it nonstop for hours upon hours upon days. I think it was maybe a week long uh, before uh, CCP uh, acknowledged things and, and the, the whole thing happened. I'm sure they were paying attention right away they, the entire time yeah. that people were shooting. They were, okay, what is the best way that we can do this? Again, and he's right, it wasn't really terribly exciting. I'd sit over his shoulder and watch him shoot pixels at pixels and the execution of it wasn't the exciting part. The exciting part was that everybody was getting together. People, you know, who were fighting each other two days prior, or people who had been at war for years, or you know, people who stayed in high second mind alone and didn't talk to anybody. All of these different people were coming together because they were all angry. As the number of players in the sandbox of Eve Online grew and became more divergent. CCP's desire to maintain good communications with their customers became increasingly challenging. A body of elected player representatives, the Council of Stellar Management, was created in 2007 both to address this and in response to player concerns following a scandal involving a CCP employee cheating on behalf of a group of players. Despite early criticisms that the CSM was little more than a PR stunt, with its opinions allegedly dismissed by CCP's management culture, the concept has evolved into a stakeholding, democratically elected group, which today fulfills a pivotal role in giving the player base a voice in the future of EVE's development. The Council of Stellar Management still has its critics, but it remains one of the most effective examples of a player advocacy group in the video game industry. I was on the CSM at the time, uh, both at the time of the riots and in the lead up to it while they were developed, they were finishing the development of Karna, and, and we, we warned them that this was not going to be received as well as, it, as they'd hoped and that they weren't communicating it properly. And um, uh, that advice was largely ignored. Well, what happened was, as soon as the uh, the crisis erupted and the Jita riots kicked off, uh, CCP called the CSM to try to have an emergency summit. Um, in the double speak of the time, they referred to it as a special summit, not an emergency summit. But uh, I think it's safe to say that uh, 
they were scared of the player outreach, excuse me, the player outcry. And uh, so I was on the CSM at the time, and they flew us out here on uh, two days of notice, say hey, you're coming to Iceland, uh, to try to essentially negotiate with the company and have an interlocutor with the player base to try to get people to stop destroying everything. Well, again, I actually do think that was a bit more of a, of a PR stunt to a degree because it got a lot more public face time. Uh, you know, seeing the Matani, that, that photo etched forever where they're in the chair together staring at each other. I mean, it was, it was kind of a smoke and mirror show to distract players from the actual issue and say, oh, look, here, we're, we're fixing it. And, and it was fun, and it was funny, and it was lighthearted, and it diverted the attention. But at the same time, they flew that group out here. They had emergency summits. There was a lot of good notes from those meetings. And, and that was really the turning point point for, for CCP taking the CSM more seriously because it took um, what was quickly becoming a very viral and volatile situation across the internet and turned it into something that was again groundbreaking and innovative and really a step in the right direction. So kudos to CCP for the way they did utilize their, their own CSM to, to do what they were supposed to do. So we were involved literally from the start of it. As, as it evolved, as the, the horror of it continued to get worse and worse, and as things, you know, one the next thing came out, and the next thing came out, we got to really kind of see in real time what some of the devs' reactions were to what was going on, and of course that affected us because I mean, you know, it was obvious that the, you know, no one, no one here was like evil or being bad or whatever else. I mean, there were there were a lot of the employees that we were talking to as well that were just as like like, whoa, what's going on? And no, I'm not particularly happy with the situation or anything either. So it gave, the C it gave the CSM a bit more of a firm ground to stand on with regard to how we chose to deal with the situation as well. It allowed us to say, you know, to, to management and the higher ups at CCP, listen, it's not just players. Your own people are grumbling about this. So like sitting through it was absolutely heartbreaking because uh, uh, like the community really loved the game and we really love the game and a lot of us come from the community and, uh, and a lot of us want this game to stay around for quite a long time. And, and seeing that kind of public reaction was, was pretty terrible. Uh, but seeing our handling of it was also, it was kind of, it was kind of awful because uh, there was a lot of things that we felt kind of we couldn't do anything about. So I was one of the people that, that really caught it bad. Like I was one of the people that really got kind of hung out to dry. And uh, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that you know, they, they linked me to the next store, which was kind of the, the name of our virtual goods store and all that stuff. And a lot of people I don't think realized that I, I never knew the prices of the items before I patched my own client at home the day after we'd gone live. And uh, there was a lot of time where, where of course, uh, there's like PR crisis management and we couldn't do anything. And I, I just kind of sat for a week or two, just watched just all these bad things happen and, and not being able to say or do anything about it. And uh, it was a really rough time. It's a really rough time. Uh, I, you know, the only thing that, that makes it a bit worse is that I think they were right. So, um, about eight percent of players quit uh, within a month, and the repercussion of that was that CCB did not have they did not have financial buffer. It didn't have enough to keep all the staff, and they ended up having to drop twenty percent of their staff worldwide, and that was a big, big moment uh, because that's pretty much never happened to CCB. They've, they've had this kind of constant organic growth year on year and they've always thought that they were kind of immune to, to ever slowing down, but it happened. What happened internally Well, 20% of them lost their jobs. Okay. Uh, because subscriptions went down and, um, you know, they, you know, people were waiting and uh, to see what CCP would do, and they weren't going to give them any more money until they they saw uh, some tangible progress. Uh, and you know, a lot of good people lost their jobs. That's that's the greatest tragedy of all of this. Was that that the real cost of this was that you know some people that I think were really great people. Um, had had to go away um, and you know I look back at it and I, I I didn't see anything more that that the CSM could have done but I wish there was more that we could have done because I think Eve would have been, 
if that had if that reduction in force had not had to happen, I really think that the game would be stronger for it. Saying goodbye to all your friends and stuff like that was uh, it was pretty heartbreaking. Uh, you know, there was a, a lot of anger internally as well. There was a lot of how are we this dumb? Why did we let this happen? And all that. It was just like a full range of emotions. It was uh, it was uh, not a fun time to be here, but uh, you know. Subscription numbers started to tell a very sad tale to CCP, and that was whenever Hilmar issued his uh, famous letter of apology. Uh, we did a post-mortem internally uh, of the whole situation. When I read it, um, I just didn't like the company we had become. Um, and I, I felt a huge sense of responsibility for that. That sort of grew in me the, the need to go and encapsulate that in a statement, uh, which was that letter. So I would say what was catalyzed the most by the postmortems we had inside the company, where people were analyzing why we were in the place we were. I thought the apology letter was good, I guess. I mean, if I was in his position, I would have written something similar. Uh, the important thing is not so much the apology, it's the actions. Uh, and afterwards, uh, they did push out Crucible, which was a very good expansion that was entirely focused on spaceships. They essentially, uh, they had to let 20% of the company go and then after that, they turned whoever was left loose to, um, to basically save the game. And uh, I think a lot of the credit for that can go to, uh, you know, obviously all the developers who were working on flying in space. Uh, but uh, CCV Soundwave, um, Christopher Toberg, uh, really helped turn the game around at around that time. Because he was the lead developer on flying in space. And then finally, after all this walking in stations nonsense, they... Uh, sort of gave him free reign to work his magic. You guys wanted spaceships, here's some spaceships. So we work by backlogs, which is basically a feature will have a number of stories that will go into it, which will complete the feature. So during Incarna, I had a private backlog of little things, and uh, I'd just been collecting, I think, 100 or 200 stories. And uh, I said, well, I have a backlog that would be good to go in two days. And uh, we pulled up the backlog and we looked at it and, uh, and people liked it. And uh, then we ended up going with it and it turned out to be a huge success. So that was, uh, that was Crucible. Crucible was uh, uh, a ton of small things focused on internet space. Um, Crucible, I would say, was as we were growing through uh, the restructuring uh, we did subsequent to Incarna, based on the postmortems, based on the action we took, following the letter, following the restructuring, reprioritization of CCP. While we were going through that, there was people in the Eve team that just sort of grabbed opportunity to really go and do things uh, that were easy, quick fixes to Eve Online that often lay by the wayside because they're smaller to some of the bigger expansions we've done. And they sort of formed and stormed around that and delivered a, a, a kick-ass expansion in that spirit while we, the company was moving through this sort of turmoil of, of restructuring itself, which is a hard thing to do. It's not a game to us. The, yeah. the, the people who come to events like this and the people who you know are 
month to month subscribers who have been playing for years and years on end. This isn't a game anymore. Sure, it starts out that way. I mean, anybody can pick up a first person shooter or an RPG and it's just a game and you turn off your console and you're done. But you invest so much time and effort and you know, blood, sweat, tears, and there are times where I've cried over things in this game. It might just be because I'm a girl. No, it's not, because I've seen him cry over things in this game, too. Yeah. It, it, that people on the outside just don't understand, because when they think of game, they think Angry Birds. And when they think of game, they think Final Fantasy. They think Zero investment. I think that, that this, the community is um, a lot more behind the company than they were. They, they sort of... Now they expect the company to do the right thing instead of the wrong thing. So I think the relationship has, it's strengthened, right? I think Incarna and Monogate and all of those things, it didn't cause like a power shift. I wouldn't, it's, that's the wrong word, but it, I think it, it, it explained to both us and the community the nature of our relationship, right? What Eve really is and how meaningful it is to both us and the community. I think that the amount that the people care about the game has not changed. People will always be very uh, protective of their passion. Many people who play Eve Online, uh, that's their hobby. Like, that's what they do every day. Um, I think that uh, the community now is in a much better place in that they uh, trust us way more and they're also just have a better game to play. <laughs> I think that that's very true. Like you, but you don't want to have a, a, a community completely devoid of emotion. I don't want apathy. And I think right now we're in a place where an expansion comes out and people are like, yeah, awesome. That's great. Like, I, and I think that as long as we keep that up, uh, we're in a super, super good place. And I really like think that the fact that there are still people that are rage, like really angry at me. I would rather they be angry at, them, at me than just not care. I would say that in general things have improved quite a lot. I mean, the game is getting more subscriptions, people are playing the game in record numbers. Uh, the company has been, uh, I think, has learned the painful lesson that they can't uh, abandon their core product, essentially. I would say my biggest lesson was at the time, I was thinking of CCP like a knowledge company. Now I think CCP like a learning company. A company that learns and a company that knows uh, are very different cultures. When you know something, you're protecting it, you're leveraging it and all that. When you have the spirit of learning something, then you're constantly moving. And um, I think of CTP much more like that after this, where it's like it is more the quest of, of knowledge than the knowledge itself that is the that is the goal. It's more the journey than the than the actual destination, if that makes sense. I am really, really happy with Eve where it is right now. I uh, I started playing almost ten years ago. And holy shit, is it a different game than 10 years ago. It's, uh, it's come a long way, and uh, we gain 40, 50,000 subscribers every year, and uh, I see no reason why that won't continue. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's awesome, and uh, when you get out here to FanFest, and there's 1,500 people who have flown out here, and it was sold out after a month, it's so humbling. It's so humbling, and I hate it when people come and thank me, because there's like 1,500 people who do a shit ton more than I do here, so it's, uh, it's pretty awesome.